Okay, uh, good morning, and thank you, Professor uh, Ritz Berger, for the uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, thanks for intro introducing and inviting me to uh, uh, Hamburg as well. I thought I'd make use of this short presentation to uh, say a few words about uh, cloud computing with especially uh, you know, emphasis on uh, innovation and learning, because I think uh, this is a topic which uh, largely under-addressed. When people talk about cloud computing, they seem to be uh, talking about automation and uh, disaster recovery and that sort of things. The other objective I want to achieve is, uh, you know, I try to articulate uh, whenever I can with some of the other speakers, uh, you know, prior knowledge that's been shared, and if possible, shed more light into inspiring everyone, including myself, uh, to uh, to think more how we can do, uh, you know, more science 2.0 and introduce this in various aspects of the uh, context. Now, of course, you know, the basic uh, modus operandi underpinning this is uh, our transformation, like it or not, into a knowledge economy, right? As uh, in a knowledge society, knowledge economy, knowledge work is prevalent. You know, we are no longer being able to uh, collate our work in a linear fashion. They come in any order, unpredictable, uh, come in small tasks, collaborative tasks. We not only have to use our own, uh, you know, experience, knowledge to solve problems, but we often have to leverage and build upon our networks, collective wisdom, harnessing the wisdom in the, uh, in the crowd, in, also in our network, in order to solve problems. However, you know, the, um, the knowledge economy and knowledge work also brings together, you know, brings to us uh, challenges, a lot of challenges. And one of the things uh, which, uh, like it or not, that spawns, I suppose, uh, Science 2.0, and many of the concepts in this conference, it's about the interactiveness, uh, the live interactiveness of the, uh, of the Web 2.0 uh, tools and trends. And through the use of this uh, kind of software, usually social software, but not always, uh, a massive number of data and uh, Connections are being built up, uh, you know, in a very rapid way. Not my research, but you can uh, surely uh, Google it, and you can find it instantly. I guarantee you, in the first page, if not, uh, you know, the even uh, more drastic. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's alarming statistics, if not disturbing. 60 seconds, you know, 100, more than 100. Uh, um, uh, LinkedIn new profile has been created. 60 seconds, uh, 669 million emails has been sent. In 60 seconds, more than 690 YouTube videos have been uploaded. So with this sort of uh, volume and rapid build-up of data, it is impossible for us to, not only just ourselves or even as a group, to stay ahead of uh, everything and be able to sift through all that information. We surely need collaborative efforts. We need uh, intelligence. And later on, I'll talk about uh, human to machine cooperative uh, problem solving in order to combat some of these problems and more. And of course, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, the next professor's talk on big data. You know, as far as I know, big data, it's uh, well, we have to, uh, you know, unlearn something in big data as well. We have to forego uh, exactness and have to deal with uh, rapid decision making with approximations. So, you know, that was the web, web 2.0, and I have to say that uh, for those uh, web 2.0 software and websites that are successful, they must have garnered a huge amount of, uh, you know, massive participation, and they got to be, you know, running on in the cloud because otherwise you cannot fulfill that sort of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, acute uh, sudden demand on uh, on resources. Now, uh, I don't want to turn this, and I will not turn this into a cloud computing presentation, other than just to point out, you know, for most people, uh, we will think about the cloud as some kind of back-end resources with scalable, a pool of resources, uh, hardware and software, and more importantly, these resources can be scaled up to support uh, any sort of uh, services in a very easy and very rapid way. The other benefits with the cloud is that, uh, in fact, uh, you know, we can shift the payment options from ongoing payment or prepayment to a post-payment mode, which uh, obviously generate a lot of benefits for small to medium-sized enterprises. So here are some of the characteristics in the cloud, flexibility, on-demand self-services. Uh, it's uh, surely running in a web uh, system, supports uh, agility, and provide media services. Not sure whether you heard about this uh, classic example. It's been cited many times in textbooks and also in conferences. Animoto. It's uh, nothing Japanese. Oh, by the way, the introduction of uh, you know, calling people to come back using the gong is very Chinese. And uh, I've been in Australia and Hong Kong for you know, almost you know, entire life. I've never you know, encountered that way of uh, asking people to come back to the room using the gong. OK. <laughs> anyway, so, so do more, and you'll become more Asianized. <laughs> Animoto has nothing to do with Japan. You know, it's uh, two uh, whiskeys in America, startup, uh, very small enterprise, very, very small. They don't have funds, and, uh, but they have a wonderful idea, which is they allow you to upload photos, and they use artificial intelligence algorithm to analyze what's in those photos, sequence them, 
collate them and phase in appropriate music and then with the appropriate, uh, you know, phase in and phase out. So it's wonderful. You submit photos, you get a video back, right? Now, being a very small firm, it's impossible for them to, uh, you know, hire marketing experts or to have a big marketing budget. So they turn to, in this case, uh, a cloud, you know, exactly, it's uh, Amazon's uh, EC tool. And they run a competition, competition for 72 hours. In 72 hours, whoever will upload the photos and come up with the best video being rated by Peter, we get by people, we get uh, an award. And uh, so they did. Wow, if you look at that, you know, in 72 hours, the capacity demand on the servers escalated to 150 times. You know, none of the world's best uh, capacity planner would be able to plan for that. So in this case, you know, Animoto got away with a great big success, not only with the uh, publicity, not only with the success of the campaign, but also adopting a post-pay model. Imagine if the campaign is not successful, only draw in a small number of people, they only have to pay whatever that's being used. So there are you know, common uses of, uh, of uh, you know, cloud uh, applications, which I'm not going to talk about, because uh, that's what most people, including other people, are focusing on. I'd like to uh, turn to services. And I believe the cloud, in many ways that I'm looking at, serve increasingly serve as a canvas to support service innovation. Some of the Tom's concepts have been talked about in, uh, in yesterday's uh, by other speakers, like co-creation of value. It's much, much easier to connect with consumers, customers, in order to collaborate to develop something or to co-solve a particular problem. Cloud obviously uh, provides a um, dynamic capability to a lot of firms, and that dynamic uh, capability is not just limited to IT, as you will see later. It also uh, covers um, uh, human resources and other types of uh, competencies as well. Cloud is about uh, invention. Uh, trying out and even dismantling business models. So once again, it's a great canvas for the discovery, alignment of uh, industry partners and other collaborators inside the cloud and be able to uh, achieve the right blend of leveraging, enabling, also uh, disruptive technologies. Customer experience underpins the ultimate success or measurement of uh, service innovation. Uh, in the previous era, we tend to focus very much on customer satisfaction. But in um, service innovation, inside the cloud in particular, we focus on the design and the enjoyment of customer experience by our customers. All right, so uh, this is one of the uh, key slides that I want to talk about. And in fact, it's the next one. <laughs> Many people consider the cloud connects people, sorry, computers, data, and a massive scale. And that is surely true. But what's missing there, and allow me to enlighten it a bit more, is I believe the cloud connects computers, data, and people at a massive scale. Now, adding the, adding the elements of people, in other words, uh, with humans, and uh, humans also have their own uh, people networks, that makes a lot of differences. To say more about this, you know, to, uh, let's uh, uh, think more about uh, what sort of uh, connections inside the cloud. And I would say that uh, there are three fundamental types of connections. The first time, the first one, as you can see here, is the uh, you know the, the cabling. So these are the hardware network connections inside the cloud. The second type of connections is what I call the people to machine connections, right? Because a cloud is not a successful cloud, or not, none of the clouds is successful if it does not garner or attract a huge number of uh, software to be installed, and a lot of people sign up to use this software. So uh, any sort of uh, social networking software that you can think of, successful, popular ones, they must be in the cloud. People start an account in there, so. By doing that, there's already a linkage between the person, you, individual, a human, with the software inside the cloud. The third type of connection is people-to-people -people connections, and these are the trusted networks, the followers, the fans that, that uh, you have built up in each and every one of your accounts. So these are people networks. So once again, three types of connections in the cloud. Now, if you subscribe to what I've just said, then uh, you can see the cloud, it's a, it's, a different, it's a different mass, put it this way. So we have the hardware, the cabling, the computers in the cloud, you know, CPU, networking resources, and so forth. We also have people in the cloud, right, or people that are accessible from the cloud, right, or by the cloud. And these people also develop networks among themselves. The cloud obviously is being used to store a lot of files, data, you know, to, and to software being, to, you know, to installed and operating on them as well. So you can generate using uh, warehousing, data warehousing, and business intelligence software, all sorts of reports, uh, whatever, whatever they are, you know, to, uh, inside the cloud as well. So together, I call this collective Mars, the knowledge cloud, right? If you uh, frame that as a knowledge cloud, we see something different. 
Firstly, in terms of the connections, you know, it's, um, uh, it's been predicted by researchers by 2020, which is not far away, you know, another four years, um, and uh, there will be something like 70 billion connections. Those three types of connections, I would say, uh, conservatively, today, 2015, there are already at least uh, 12 to 13, or maybe more, billion connections there. Of course, you know, it's, uh, to be honest, not all those connections are, are reachable. You know, many of them are protected or private. Gartner Group also uh, boldly predict by 2016, which is just around the corner, uh, two years and, uh, and half a year, uh, you know, a third of our digital content, each and every one of us, will be stored in the cloud. So there's really an awful amount of information that we can make use of and accessible uh, inside the cloud. I'd like to, uh, you know, to articulate with uh, uh, Professor Bergman's talk yesterday. He talked about uh, or proposing a uh, European uh, research cloud, and uh, one of the things that he talked about is uh, this uh, data layer. Uh, and also the uh, services layer and also the governance layer. And I remember he uses the word uh, harmonize the data, harmonize the services, and harmonize the uh, governance. So coming back to uh, the concept that I just talked about, uh, the knowledge cloud, I see the cloud as a, uh, a critical mass, as an intelligent engine operating in, in, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the world. So if you combine you know, what we already know, that uh, as long as the hardware and the um, um, cabling and the networking hard, uh, stuff inside the cloud with the people, then I consider you know, we are dealing with an intelligent knowledge center with massive data and problem solving skills. And these skills are best represented, manifest, by a combination of processes, software, and human intelligence. And uh, of course, being a cloud concept, these are scalable. So in other words, you can, uh, uh, you know, so ideally speaking, we can approach and select individual groups of people, discover them, approach them, seek their advice, or, in, or, in, or offer a, a space for them to collaborate and be able to solve problems, obviously, on many occasions, with incentives. So in that regard, the cloud is disruptive, extremely disruptive. Now, that's not entirely new. You know, we can learn it from uh, animal uh, um, you know, patterns as well. Memoration is a pattern where birds, uh, they fly in, uh, uh, in holding patterns, and uh, they, uh, they do that, I suppose, uh, on the left photo, to, uh, to deter uh, prey, right? And uh, in a similar vine, uh, a swarm of uh, goose are swimming in a, uh, in a cluster way to uh, protect themselves and also to, uh, to make them feel warmer, I suppose. So can we also mimic this kind of intelligence? using the cloud, and I think we can, and researchers are already making a head start into this area. So with this intelligent cloud from problem solving, I see there are at least there are three paths that we can explore, and they are you know, not mutually exclusive. First one, the, if there are problems that uh, we farm it out to the cloud, some of these problems naturally are you know, inclined or dedicated, more suitable for humans, humans only to solve, and we have to deal with, it with massive numbers. But that's fine, because a cloud success is its ability to reach out to a massive number of people. Second type of connections, or second type of uh, solving problem, is computational problem. Maybe it is a problem that requires a huge array, a huge array of computers, you know, with special software to, uh, to crunch these numbers, like weather forecasting. Fine, in the cloud we can set up clusters to do this, and we can farm out those problems to, uh, to those that dedicated farm of uh, computers. Then uh, there's a third way, of course, which I thought is uh, extremely enlightening, is to combine the two dynamically to achieve human cooperative problem solving, which partly, partially some of the problems go to machines, partially some of the problems go to humans, and then combine the uh, solution together. So a cartoonistic way of uh, enacting what I've just said, if we have problems that we can uh, farm up to the cloud, whatever that problem is, we have logic in the cloud to decompose a problem into uh, various uh, subcomponents to identify whether any of these subcomponents are better for humans, for machines, or combination of human machines to solve in order to uh, proceed to the next level. Researcher John Fisher has defined this uh, definition for cloud logic uh, in, the, in the cloud environment, which I'm not going to read, and uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, information that you can find out more about um, you know, cloud intelligence. Uh, for those of you who uh, you know, can't wait to put your hands on it, you know, there are commercial software around, uh, IFTTT, if, if this, then that. 
It's a simple business rule system that you can set up and in your, uh, you know, in your own uh, discretion uh, in the public cloud, and you can, uh, you know, set that. Uh, look, if uh, Berlin's weather uh, or Hamburg's weather is um, uh, going below the two degrees uh, centigrade, then send me an email or send me an SMS. Right. So these are personal knowledge management tactics that you can apply using some personal business rules in the cloud. More examples. Do you really need more? Well, uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Walkwell also talked about pseudo online, as well as this um, uh, transcribed uh, Bethlehem project, which is uh, obviously one of them, to, uh, one of the, uh, the ways of asking humans to solve problems uh, in the cloud. The concept is not new, harnessing wisdom of the cloud. For those of you who, um, who uh, like uh, astronomy, you, know, you may have come across Galaxy Zoo before. So it's a website that asks people to look at photos and contribute. So five photos. Uh, and ask you whether you, know, you see a, a, milk, a Milky Way, in other words, a spiral uh, around the star system. And if there's a spiral, is it, uh, you know, what direction is it spinning? So here we go. Top left, there's a spiral. Difficult to tell the direction. Top middle, there's a spiral. Clearly, it's county court rise. And uh, top right, there are two spirals, interlocking ones, but it's difficult to tell the dominating direction. Bottom left, there's a spiral. Clearly, it's spinning clockwise. And bottom right, there is no um, you know, the Milky Way to talk about at all. So stop there. How long have we used you know, using our human eyes to interpret those five photos? Less than 20 seconds. That's a wow, you know? These are exactly the problem in the cloud that we farm enough to humans to do, because human has got millions of them. And uh, of course, that doesn't mean that uh, always the answer come back is true. Uh, we have to work out some kind of mechanism to, uh, to uh, work out the trust and the authenticity of the result. Americans ahead, again, to Amazon's Mechanical Turk, still a research and beta project. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, go and sign up an account, and you can declare tasks and ask the cloud or people in the cloud to solve it for you. And um, you have to provide some incentives. You can define the period that you want to uh, start your, uh, your project to be tackled by other people, and also when you want it to, uh, to finish. And a snapshot of some of the tasks that is available on a particular day, you can see that uh, half of those tasks available, they are classification. Obviously, humans is better than machines, uh, I suppose, uh, because we've got the context. And the second last one, you know, to, uh, checking up uh, people's record. You know, that uh, sounds like something is being put up by private investigators or, human or, uh, or the police department. And the last one is, uh, you know, is this person a musician? And that, to me, is another wow, because even the, the might of Google, it cannot give you a yes, no answer. So human decision or human opinion is needed to uh, carry out those uh, investigations. You may have come across uh, this, uh, this software we call Recapta, right, or Recapture. Where do you see it? Well, that's on website which asks you to authenticate that uh, you are indeed a human and not a spider. You, are, you know what I mean? A computer spider that is uh, crawling over a website. They usually give you two words. Do you know that one of those words, the computer already know the answer, the exact answer? Which means, do you know that one of the two words, the, the computer doesn't know the real answer, right? So recapture, it's a, uh, it's a result of a Carnegie Mellon a PhD project. So that company is being set up to do machine translation, digitalization. Whenever it encounters a word that it can't understand because it's too rough, too blurred, whatever, it will use recapture and send it over to uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of websites and ask people when they are authenticating to provide those keywords, all right? And they've set a threshold, so maybe about 20 of the human's uh, answer matches, then bingo, it will feed it back to the machine translation or machine recognition software and continue and take that word to be whatever the, uh, the blurry scribble. So, and uh, they have publicly declared, uh, you know, th thank you to the world, it's been saving them one million US dollars a day. All right, a little bit about our own work. It's a uh, taxonomy, foxonomy system. Um, and, you know, to, um, everyone knows about the taxonomy, which is uh, in a way of classifying material. We can apply that to a shared drive, we can apply that to a file system, we can apply that to a website, we can apply it to a, a document management system as well. Uh, you know, taxonomy rarely changes. You know, of course, organizations have a responsibility to look after and update them, but in the real world, it rarely changes, and it's top down. Coupling with a foxonomy system makes a lot of sense if we can combine it, because foxonomy, it's gathering of text at the user level, right? In Flickr, in uh, YouTube, in uh, many of those social networking websites, people provide labels and you gather them, you analyze them. 
So combining the two, uh, in one of our projects, we were able to find you know, the middle of road approach that come up with a hybrid navigation mechanism. And uh, that makes a lot of sense because on the one hand, there's a top-down governance about the general structure. But on the other hand, there's also sufficient and rapidly refreshed uh, uh, tags that's provided by people people, you know, uh, that, uh, that can help to navigate. A number of hurdles needs to be uh, overcome, which I'm not going to go into details. In this case, it's an English uh, system where we have to handle a lot of uh, syntaxes and uh, syntactic uh, incorrectness, uh, recover from uh, incorrect keywords, and also merging of uh, stems and variants of, uh, of words, uh, identify whether these words are authentic or not. But you cannot throw, a word for, throw out the word, for example, is iPhone is not in a dictionary, but you still have to recover it and uh, use it. And then uh, that's uh, by checking WordNet and other things. So what sort of applications we can do to it? Now, this is uh, a, a poster by the Hong Kong Railway System. You know, it's a, a very nice example of uh, illustrating how we can apply to it. In this case, you can see that there's a route map you know, of the train system on the, uh, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, even though that is not in German or in English, but you can kind of see there's photos of some tourist attraction places. But this whole thing is static. It's a poster that is being put out, put out by the marketing department of the railway company. So what our system actually does or can do is to refresh the, uh, the tourist attraction part by citizens' contributions, right? And that's a, a Science 2.0 concept. We have applied it to software, uh, developed a prototype, and applied it to several sites, including the US uh, Environmental Protection site. And what you're seeing here is uh, its application to the Hong Kong Tourism web page, which I thought is quite appropriate for this audience. So on the top left, we use um, uh, Delicious, which is a social networking, sorry, social bookmarking software site in the cloud, and gather thousands of texts, and we analyze those texts. And on the bottom left is, uh, you know, you see it, and it's real, and it's the, um, the uh, sitemap of the Hong Kong Tourism Board web pages depicting uh, you know, major tourist attractions in Hong Kong. On the right, you can see that the merged uh, uh, sitemap, which is based on the original sitemap structure with new text that is being analyzed, filter, refurbished, and add back to the sitemap. So you can see that, for example, traditionally, if you want to find out where can I see pandas in Hong Kong, right? You search in Google, and uh, you may come to this site, and then you look at uh, different pages, look at the different websites, and see which one mentions panda, right? Or you can uh, rely on Google keyword search. But in this case, we give you a third way of navigation, because pandas is commonly a word that people use, people use to refer to Ocean Park. Uh, in Hong Kong. So you can see that panda is a word, it's a label that's being added to the sitemap, right? So in this case, uh, I thought it's, uh, it's quite useful. So the people uh, are being offered an additional dimension for navigation, which uh, frees them up uh, from uh, reading and searching, and it's very much based on uh, citizens' uh, contributions. This goes back to, uh, you know, to my response or my suggestion to one of Professor Tottenham's uh, opening uh, points yesterday. He said that, you know, where does the library sit? The library provides so much classification material, you know, using a jewelry classification and other things, and many people come and navigate for these things. So perhaps you can also erect a similar type of system to collect massive amount of tags for, for uh, generating an enhanced uh, classification system. So allow me to finish uh, in about five minutes and finish up with, uh, with learning. I'd like to uh, take on two aspects about how to use the cloud for learning. If uh, what we're hearing to, uh, from other speakers are correct, uh, allow me to summarize it. I believe there are major forces impacting the learning landscape. Firstly, you know, the onset of the knowledge work, which I've mentioned before, uh, the, uh, you know, it's a proliferation of social media and the speed in which these things are being gathered. Of course, mobile devices, mobile technologies continue to revolutionize, uh, you know, to, uh, the way that we learn. There's a skill gap up there, skill gap out there, which many universities may not realize or may not uh, uh, be preaching at the moment. But that's outside the, um, the scope of my talk. What I really want to focus on is, uh, you know, are you know, P-based personal learning environments for individual knowledge workers, as well as this concept called MOOCs, massive open online courses. Let's start with the, the MOOC first, Introduction to AI. I think uh, many here, if not all, uh, teach this course. You know? uh, I teach uh, certain um, parts of this course at PolyU as well. And uh, some years ago, I realized that, hey, you know, there's a MOOC out there. So I directed my students to look at this uh, rather than you know, to, uh, going through all the major concepts. But uh, during the class, I will explore in-depth concepts with them. But it all started in 2011 when two Stanford professors 
um, realized that you know, every year we teach this course to 500 and 600 students. Why don't we just record the video and put it online so that more people can benefit? You know, the students who, are, who come, they will come. For the students who don't come, at least they've got uh, you know, a digital copy that we can reply. And to their surprise, that 500 and 600 students a year turn out to be 160K, 160,000 students across nearly 200 countries. Well, once again, you, know, you need to have a cloud in order to support that. But MOOCs is a lot more than you know, running e-learning on the cloud, a lot more. more right? Now, to, uh, I'm not trying to get into a debate into MOOC here. Some people you know, to, uh, shut off you know, <laughs> once you talk about MOOCs. They don't trust about the authenticity nor the quality of the courses. And uh, some people also discount the fact that, look, uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't gone through uh, strict uh, academic uh, accreditation. So many of these courses may not be, uh, you know, may not be uh, trustworthy enough or authentic enough to be, uh, to be recognized, to be uh, converted to a degree. And that sort of thing is certainly true. All universities are still uh, struggling, I think that's the right word, to uh, look for a viable business model for MOOC. But uh, it defines many of the things that we know. You, know? you don't uh, screen the qualifications of the applicants, and most of the assessments are online. Uh, in fact, all of them are online. Most of them are multiple choice only, and uh, you don't have any face-to-face -face contact with any of the learners at all. However, you know, that said, many MOOC providers cropped up, uh, mostly American, but uh, several European and also uh, one or two Australian as well. Why universities are supporting MOOCs? Well, uh, I think the writing is on the wall. Many of them want to raise the profile. Many of them want to uh, you know, extend the reach of the of the, uh, education to a much, much bigger group of people. Um, but I think that uh, there are more innovative uh, users of MOOCs available. For example, uh, me and uh, some of my colleagues and in uh, PolyU and many other universities as well are using MOOCs, as I said, uh, to uh, enact the flip the classroom. So instead of teaching a course uh, or teaching a particular topic and using the precious two or three hours, we ask the student to reply a recorded lecture first. And then when we go into the lecture, that precious two or three hours, we engage in deep you know, topic discussions. And that's exactly what are we doing on Saturday when I return to Hong Kong. Uh, our university is also leveraging on MOOCs to embark and start on blended learning because it sounds too hard you know, if you just try to push uh, e-learning and blended learning to many staff. But MOOCs seem to be uh, you know, a logical sequence uh, or at least an immediate point for them to, uh, to explore. To crowdsource quality content, not only from teachers, but also from learners. Two examples there. The first one, I suppose, uh, you know, German University is very proud. Uh, German uh, MOOC provider, Iversity, you know, several years ago, put up a, a fund for, I think it's 10,000 uh, euros, okay? to invite the world's professors, anybody, you know, to suggest a topic that you want to put on Iversity. Iversity will pay for the hosting uh, and, uh, and the running of the subject. So, and they uh, ask you to provide a 10 minutes, uh, you know, a sample of the course that you would like to provide. And the winner is being given, uh, you know, a certain period of time and also 10,000 euro to uh, develop that course and offer in university. Now that, that has a uh, disruptive input to university, right? Traditional university would think that, uh, traditionally, university would think that we ask our professors to develop a course. If we don't have that expertise, we either learn it or hire another person to do it. But in this case, you can go to the world and ask people, you know, who excel in certain areas, compete, submit a proposal on certain course, and you pick the best brain and develop a course and host it on your platform. The same goes with crowdsourcing the content from the learners. In one of the universities in Hong Kong, I think it's uh, uh, University of Hong Kong actually, they have a uh, MOOC course on Chinese uh, historical buildings or nice uh, architectures of Asian buildings. So in one of the assignments, the professors said that uh, uh, students around the world go and take pictures of uh, Asian uh, oriental architectures in your own build, in your own city, all right? And submit that as your assignment. And he promised you'll pick the best and embed it into the second uh, you know, delivery of the learning content. So using this, you reach out to an audience and draw on their input to better your content in the subsequent deliveries. So more and more of these uh, uh, wonderful stories are, are coming out as well. And in our university, we are you know, rapidly preparing for our MOOC and preparing for these uh, things to, uh, to, uh, to become innovative. Well, we are in alliance with the edX platform, and I'd like to uh, especially uh, um, you know, mentioned that uh, we are preparing our first MOOC, uh, Knowledge Revolution, from KM, Big Data, to Cloud Services, and we aim to launch it in August of this year. A very special thank you, and uh, 
and pay our respect to um, um, uh, Professor Totterman and his team that help us a big hand on the sections on Science 2.0, open link data, and social media. And uh, Prof Totterman has been, and his team has been very, working very hard with our team to coordinate content, recording videos, and so forth. And separate, and in addition to what I've just said, our team is also on the research level working on the personalization engine to identify the learning analytics uh, that is so needed to help with the individualization of the, uh, of the pedagogy and learning content that we can deliver to uh, students. Finally, you know, to, uh, allow me to talk about a little bit about micro learning in the, inside the cloud. And everyone, I think, agrees today, you know, learning is not just, you know, one big core, although I'm doing that for the last 25 minutes, which is no good. Right? We're supposed to be talking to each other and learning with each other. I observe my students often uh, you know, form the ad hoc uh, learning groups, and they learn from each other as well as from other people as well. So some years ago, uh, I did some research and developed a platform, a personal learning environment and network, I call it BLEN. So basically, it's a, uh, it's a platform that operates on the Google tools. So anyone who operates using a standard set of uh, Google tools, in fact, all we need is Google+, Plus, Google+, Plus community, and the Google address book, all right, and the Gmail address. So once you have those four things, I'll give you the guidelines to all my students uh, to set up a personal learning environment. In that environment, we also have uh, automatic RSS feeds of uh, quality content coming, free, coming in from uh, various topics. I select them, but later on, students also contribute. So other than that, uh, they can do whatever they like. They can add whatever learning components into their own learning environment. So some students use uh, Gmail, they use uh, Flickr, they use uh, Wikipedia, and they can use uh, Symbaloo and uh, among other things as well. And through this environment, I brought together teachers, students, graduates, which is not easy uh, for, you know, for a traditional university environment, and other practitioners. And uh, today, you know, after operating in this environment to more than 2,000 students at PolyU, I've extended the platform to uh, universities in uh, Thailand, as well as tried uh, fusing classes from the different uh, levels and also from different universities into one to stimulate, uh, you know, to further learning and knowledge fertilization. So with, uh, for those of you who want to know more about this kind of platform, I have a brochure to, uh, to talk about that. And it's, uh, it's in the public domain, so there's nothing secret about it. And it's been a very uh, uh, productive and uh, rewarding platform for all of us. So uh, wonderful um, opportunity for me. And I'd like to uh, finish there. And thank you. And put it back to uh, Professor Wittberger. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, questions? One or two questions, if possible. A lot of information. I have one. Uh, yes. Regarding the social bookmarking things you, you mentioned, um, did you make any research uh, whether the bookmarks you got from, uh, from people uh, from the social bookmarking areas are different to them? Are they on another type of taxonomy? Are they broader? Are they more specific? Or is there any, uh... Okay, based on the, uh, the text that we have collected, which is in the thousands uh, mark, uh, we have uh, derived a certain several uh, generalizations and learnings, right? Uh, the people who started using the tags, you know, sometimes they may use the wrong tag, and other people don't bother correct correcting them. So, for example, uh, when you talk about uh, Soho, maybe you, you should use night live. Well, I find that people use night light, and all other people continue to just plus one, plus one, plus one on that tag. So, the second thing is, uh, you know, to, again, referring to Hong Kong, some people type Hong space Kong, some people type HK, some people type Hong K. And, and many others. So we do have to use a lot of ad hoc rule of thumb and linguistic technologies to clean all that up and consolidate it. Right? So uh, you are right. You know, tags have no hierarchy, uh, although there has been some research done to try to, to, try to uh, rediscover some uh, dependent and uh, network relationships among the tags. But uh, so far, I don't think that uh, that has developed into a full-scale uh, research momentum.